Good evening, everyone. I'm Council Member Monique Anderson Walker. We're going to wait for about three minutes until we actually hit the 630 mark to get started. Uh, we've just opened up so that people can come in and we look forward to getting started in a couple of minutes. Yeah, we're, they're slowly coming in. We're almost at 40. I know we have a lot of people that have registered, but they're slowly coming. The number that we see is accurate. Good evening again, everybody. My name is Councilwoman Monique Anderson Walker, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to our Transforming Communities meeting. Uh, we call these Transforming Communities meetings as opposed to um, just a regular meeting or town hall, because our whole purpose for these meetings is to engage the community, engage our agencies to find ways to transform to become even stronger and even better. Um, we have several uh, panelist speakers with us today and uh, out of consciousness of their time and the, the hour, we wanna make sure that we get through um, the presentation. Um, I'm gonna speak a little slowly just because my tendency is to speak very fast and I wanna make sure that you do understand everything that I am saying and that if there are questions that you have an opportunity to uh, put them in the chat or uh, raise your hand. If you put them in the chat, um, my staff will collect them and be able to respond to them as well. Uh, we are so grateful uh, to have gotten to this point. Um, it's been an incredible 
year plus, year and a half, almost two years uh, in this COVID period, I think we've all learned so much. We have all turned outward. And when I say turn outward, we have had no choice but to really spend more time outdoors and to perhaps even get a greater appreciation of where we are and our land and the reason for making sure that we can preserve what we do have and recognition that uh, to a large degree, what we have around us is an indicator of our health and the health of our communities. Um, you'll hear later from uh, individuals speaking about um, environmental challenges that we're all having around the country, but that um, we're working diligently to find solutions to. And that is, you know, with flooding and of course the attendant issues of mold. Uh, and, and to that, to that um, end, looking at silting, some of the issues we're having with silting in our waterways. Uh, District 8 is unique in that it stretches from National Harbor, so right at the mouth of the Potomac River, uh, inward into the Beltway, outward outside of the Beltway, and then um, is inclusive eastward of all of Joint Base Andrews and a Branch Avenue Metro. I think it's important to know the geography of where we are and what's contained here. Um, you'll, you'll hear later why this is important. Um, as we as we face some of the challenges, um, but I, before we talk about any of those things, I do want to uh, speak to some of the wonderful things that are happening in the community right now. And we'll take a moment. Um, we'll actually take a moment to to show the video, uh, which is next, and then I'll go through a few of our. Um, new attractions in District 8. As of course you know, I, I love to refer to it as District Gur 8, District Great. Um, these new locations we refer to as D8 spots or our new date spots. You know, I'm here all night, so uh, who knows what else we're here. <laughs> but let's get started with the, um, with the video. This is Prince George's County, Maryland, District 8 to be exact. World leaders enter and exit America through this international gateway at Joint Base Andrews, where Air Force One is housed. One can access the capital bike trails that connect throughout the region. Forests bathe under the canopies throughout our lush Green County. Come learn and explore our thoroughbred horse farming routes. Explore an actual battery at Fort Washington National Park. Experience our campgrounds, taste our cheesecake, and shop our local businesses. Did you know George Washington navigated the Potomac River Inlet waters of Broad Creek to attend the historic St. John Church? Our west-facing Potomac River waterfront communities are the envy of the region. Just check out this sunset. Our vibrant, engaged, and active communities abut award-winning parks and recreation sites. Get exposed to our diverse cultural expressions in our arts district and through our award-winning parks and recreational programs and STEM camps. This county has produced well-known physicians, educators, business owners, elite athletes, musicians, artists, actors, and farmers. Plan your destination healthcare services here with our renowned doctors. Skate in our indoor state-of-the-art ice rink. Swim in pools that produce the best swimmers in the country and touch the land that the beloved native Piscataway tribe cultivated and protected. Prince George's County's rich cultural heritage is our calling card and has the distinction of being the most affluent, predominantly African American county in the country. Proximity to Washington, D.C., and our highly educated workforce makes this booming community a desirable site for businesses and great living. The opportunities are endless here, and so is the shopping and entertainment. Did I mention the month-long Lake Arbor Jazz Summer Concert Series kicking off in July? We welcome you to explore and delight in all that we are. This is Prince George's County. This is District Great. I'm Prince George's County Councilwoman Monique Anderson-Walker, and I represent this great district. We look forward to welcoming you here very soon.
That's actually a, a sampling of what we're looking to put together. It's in draft form, uh, but looking to continue to promote Prince George's County, all of Prince George's County. Of course, I represent district great. So um, my portion of this video will look like this, but the hope is that all of our council members will uh, find an opportunity to try to highlight those wonderful things in the district. And many of those are free. Um, and, and you can't get them everywhere. So we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, the resources here. Uh, I do wanna to touch on some of the wonderful things that uh, piggybacking on what you just saw. Uh, we have wonderful trail systems. We have about 180 miles of trails inside of um, Prince George's County. And these are biking trails as well as uh, you know, hiking trails, many of which are uh, beside wonderful creeks. Uh, which really makes for a, a, a tremendous experience um, to get out. And hopefully we can advance to the next slide and we'll be able to actually see some of the, the visuals. The next slide. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is actually uh, on our trails, uh, biking with representatives from Texas uh, that, that came to Prince George's County. Uh, they actually came here for a National Association of Counties meeting. Uh, we had uh, taking them on on bike rides and uh, when they came back there was actually a delegation that was trying to avoid the quorum in Texas um, as to uh, not have to vote for voter suppression laws um, when they were here they reached out to us and said we want to we want to ride with you again and we want to see more Prince George's County so we're very excited that we had an opportunity to um, to advance uh, that opportunity to them as well and to teach people about all that Prince George's County is. Uh, it's good also to know we're not Washington DC. We have our own flavor. We've got our own um, special qualities and we wanna make sure that we start to promote those uh, and not just be the outside community, the outside of the district. Um, but we can advance to the next slides. I will say that we are looking to um, promote more ridership. Uh, we have an event coming up on Saturday, uh, October 2nd at Bach Road uh, from 12 to 2, and that will present opportunities for people to learn uh, different riding techniques. And for those who want to ride trails, they can join us as well. Uh, this slide represents our new circulator, our District 8 circulator. So we call it a date to circulate. And we actually have two dates, during, two days during the week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, where we go to six of our senior apartment buildings and we um, get them out to go shopping. This is all free to them as well. Shopping, uh, grocery shopping that is. Uh, we also drop them off at Tanger Outlets, um, bring them to locations like Bach Road for exercise, entertainment, and to engage with other people. So we're really trying to make sure that our senior population um, is not isolated um, for, for their personal, physical health, but also their mental health. We can move on to the next slide. We're very excited about our District 8 Global Air Drone Academy, which kicked off in July. It is the only camp of its type in Prince George's County and it's in District 8. Uh, what's wonderful about this is that it's free. Um, I was able to utilize some funds uh, to underwrite about $75,000 for uh, several weeks of camp for students. Uh, the students range from elementary school students all the way up to and through high school. What's extraordinary about this is the students get to build their own drone that they take home with them. They learn how to program the drone. They learn the rules of uh, drone uh, flying. And the whole purpose of this is to get students in a position where they can have used several applications of this drone technology for career opportunities for them, um, as well as safety and, um, and, and other covert uses. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that too. We, we partnered with Joint Base Andrews. They were very excited about this and, and uh, decided that they wanted to take it out of Oxen Hill High School where we had it for uh, the first four weeks and uh, bring it on to Joint Base Andrews, uh, which is tremendous. Um, that exposure experience brought another level of, of learning. Uh, in addition to our drone program, Joint Base Andrews has its own counter drone program. 
uh, that they are very interested in teaching our students about so that our students can then learn how to counter the counter drone measures. <laughs> um, we've also, through this process, um, had the uh, intelligence community reach out to us to join us in partnership. Um, and in this respect, we're looking forward to our high school students getting internships that will um, support uh, students, some students, qualifying students, to receive uh, security clearances. We think it's important to look at um, career readiness well before graduation. And uh, many of these students can get their, their drone license by age 16 and can actually start their own careers working for realtors, um, getting imagery from above, working um, in safety, uh, road and power companies. So there's, there's so many options. And this is, this is truly a STEM, STEAM area, science, technology, arts, engineering, arts, and mathematics that is, um, that's really gonna put us ahead of, of a lot of other um, areas. So we're happy that Prince George's County has this. Uh, and we're happy that Joint Brace Andrews has um, decided to, um, to take a bigger role in this. Let's move on to the next slide. We also had ribbon cutting at Tucker Road Ice Rink, uh, which is the reopening of an ice rink that I skated on um, many years ago. I'm 50 now, so you can imagine. I was a very, very little girl. And uh, it's just exceptional to see that uh, the capability of this site now has uh, two NHL regulation um, ice rink with the potential for two. There's one existing and space for, for another one. Um, our, our students, our kids can learn everything or continue to compete. Uh, the Ducks, uh, who have been phenomenal hockey, um, hockey team for quite some time. And then we have our figure skaters who um, have gotten national recognition. So let's, let's move on to the next slide. One of the other big, uh, I don't know if you call this a date place, but it is in D8. Uh, this is a hospital, uh, Adventist Healthcare. We're very excited about uh, what Adventist Healthcare brings to our region. Um, they are renowned for their, um, their brilliance in, in medicine and in um, bringing up the quality of health in areas where they decide to locate. So we're happy that they're here in Fort Washington and uh, we understand that they're looking for a certificate of, of need for greater expansion which is tremendously important. During uh, the kickoff of COVID, uh, this area was hit greatly. Uh, and uh, the woman that you're looking at on the um, right side of the screen is uh, Yunmi Shim. She's a visionary. And she recognized early on that there weren't going to be enough beds in that hospital to really um, address people's needs. So uh, she coordinated with and uh, really moved and shook to get temporary uh, hospital beds, 46 additional ones, um, working with the governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, and, um, and, uh, and his wife as well, Yumi. Uh, we can move on to the next. Uh, Prince George's County, uh, District 8, represented uh, at the MACO con conference, which is the Maryland Association of Counties conference. Um, I moderated this in focusing on safety or road safety, uh, not just for vehicle, but also for pedestrians and cyclists. Everyone who likes to get outdoors and get on the road um, has a role to play in their own safety. Um, and, and these are some of the opportunities we have to, to present that. If you're not familiar with hashtag driving at home, just Google hashtag driving at home and you can learn about the tenets of it. This is something that kicked off here in Prince George's County. This was my initiative. Uh, in February 2019 and uh, became very well received and expanded in partnership with Montgomery County, uh, with Northern Virginia, Fairfax County, as well as Washington, DC. And uh, we're looking forward to changing driving culture. We wanna start them young and get their minds to default towards what the right thing to do is. Um, and, and this, uh, these are photographs of uh, Major General Joel Jackson, who is the commander of the 316th uh, Wing at Joint Base Andrews, and, uh, and um, also Commander um, 
Tyler Shaw, who is uh, with the 89th Airborne. Um, so this is where our, um, this, this photograph was actually at the 9-11 commemoration. And, uh, you know, we're just so blessed really to have, uh, to be surrounded by um, so much um, support and um, a desire to really reach into the community to participate uh, with, the, with the base leadership. So we can move on. I participated in a Women's Equality Day. I was the only civilian that did. And uh, that was an honor for me uh, to hear about what life is like for women on base. Um, we all have kind of a, an assumption, but it was great to, to be a part of it. And it was great to have um, our commanders, the commanders there who, who are men, who initiated this because it, it speaks a lot to um, their desire to have a better understanding of what um, everyone goes through and how they can be helpful. Next slide, please. Uh, two of our businesses that opened up recently, Mahogany Books, which is at National Harbor. National Harbor has really turned over. You know, COVID was rough in some respects, but it presented opportunities in other respects as well. So more of our local businesses have had opportunities to come in and to, um, to, uh, to thrive. Uh, Zen Yoga Studio, it will be opening up uh, fourth quarter 2021, so the next couple of months. So we look forward to, to all of that, um, really to, to help us with our mind, body, spirit. Next slide, please. Uh, and this, this made my year. Um, Safeway has been a tremendous community partner. Safeway partnered with us and with uh, faith-based organizations during COVID to provide vaccinations. And um, what was phenomenal, what was phenomenal is that we had pharmacists come out and literally spend a day, a week, giving vaccines um, over, over several weeks. And, uh, and we were able to, to really help a lot of people. Uh, what's extraordinary also is that they're, they're now under new ownership. Albert Sons owns them now. And they have invested uh, over $2 million in the Safeway at Rivertown. I had an opportunity to come out to the ribbon cutting, uh, the reopening of it, and was just so impressed with just the airiness, the brightness of, of the store. I'd been in the store before. It didn't look that great. <laughs> so now it looks fantastic. They have 9,000 uh, new items. In addition to plant-based section, organic se sections, and high quality meats and seafood. Um, it was very impressive to go in there, but more than that, it was impressive to see the passion and the love that the leadership um, put into it. And we're, we're fortunate today because we have with us, um, is it Phil White is with us, as well as Donovan Ford. So Phil White's a district manager of Albertsons and Donovan Ford, I would love for you all to just uh, speak a little bit about um, what all you're doing, what Safeway's doing here. What more is coming? Sure. Um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great to see you. Um, outstanding to see you. And, uh, you know, I got to see Gina uh, not too many weeks ago as we're working on another project. Um, and thank you guys for um, uh, meeting with me to initiate, how can we help more in district great? Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk just for a, a short time and then I'm gonna turn it over to the most important person uh, in my organization. That would be the district manager, Phil White that really makes everything happen and come to life. Um, he, he has been such a value to our organization and, and I wanna let him have credit for talking about what's to come with Fort Washington. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna do the same thing high level. Uh, we're gonna do the same thing that Fort Washington uh, deserves and uh, that Oxen Hill or Riverside got. Uh, a remodel that's already started. Um, I would tell everybody else on the call that uh, we sped the time frame up after uh, some strong nudge from the councilwoman and Gina Anderson Ford. So um, 
it's exciting times. I do want to apologize to the community of Fort Washington. It is way past due uh, for what we're doing now, and we realize it. Um, this last year, in 12 months, we remodeled more stores in the Safeway organization that's local, Virginia, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., the Maryland, Delaware market. We did more remodels in one year uh, than what has been done in five years combined. Um, huge investment in the areas, big investment in District 8, our district great. Um, you know, genuinely, uh, we can only do this because your community allows us to do it. Um, we serve the community. Our role is to understand that everybody on this call is who we work for and who affords us the opportunity to have a career as well as the finances to continue to grow invest and improve. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Phil. Uh, I will, I, before I turn it over, I'd like to say I've been in this business over 30 years and I've uh, served many markets from uh, the West Coast to literally from Los Angeles all the way to Bangor, Maine to Texas, Louisiana. Um, and I will tell you, being involved with the local government um, council folks. Um, and I say this genuinely, uh, the relationship that has been built in not even a year with the District 8 leadership is the best I've ever had in 30 plus years. And for everyone on the call, I say that because it's the most genuine leadership group in the district that I've ever experienced with genuinely wanting to help a community be better. So with that, I say thank you to the councilwoman and to Gina for um, their help in building this relationship that's incredible with our corporation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Phil to speak on, you know, what is the investment? Uh, he'll give you a number. Uh, that we're going to invest in the storm Fort Washington. I can assure you that we always go over budget, it seems. So it will be on the low side, the number that he's going to give you. And he'll talk about what are the added values of this remodel. Uh, and then he'll also have an ask of the community where we need some help uh, around staffing in the area. So with that, thank you for letting us be on the call. Uh, more importantly, thank you to everyone on this call for supporting our great company that I serve and um, look forward to uh, not only Fort Washington, but much, much more to come with our support to the district. Thank you. Thank you, Donovan. Great comments. I think Donovan stole a lot of what I wanted to say, so ditto to what Donovan had to say. I, I do want to talk about briefly on the meeting that we had with Gina, and I think that was probably in the last four weeks or so. Absolutely fantastic, and what a great district to work with. And like Donovan said, for me, the best we've ever had. It is absolutely a partnership. We love being involved in the community, and it makes it so easy. So thank you. Look forward to your our other meetings that I know that we're gonna have in the future, partnering and helping each other. Just a quick state of the union on where we are in Fort Washington right now. We are, we have started a remodel. We're at the beginning stages of it. Um, it's about a $1.5 million remodel, which brings a lot of new things to the store, a lot of new equipment. They're in the middle of uh, painting and changing decor as we speak now. That part should be done soon and then we'll work toward equipment. Uh, we're also going to be resetting. You're probably gonna see six to 8,000 new items that will come into the store in various departments and all the departments will be touched with new items. So that's always exciting, always, always great feedback 
from the customers when they see the new variety that's brought into the store. So I think everyone is gonna be super excited as we go through, there'll be some dust and bumps as we go through the remodel as there always is, but the end result, uh, I think as Donovan mentioned before, uh, well overdue. And I think the community is gonna be very, very happy when they see the end result. Uh, Cause one thing Safeway does, they do remodels on a grand scale. The one I asked that I have, I was talking to Jesse, the store director in Fort Washington earlier today, and he was able today, he hired eight individuals today, and he's been hiring every day he tries to hire. So my ask for the community, uh, we are accepting and interviewing daily. And as of this evening, he's looking for 12 to 15 more and would love to hire those tomorrow, interview and hire. He will interview on the spot and the process is pretty quick. So if yourself, if you're listening, you're looking for a, a, a job, even if it's part-time, the hours are very flexible. If you have a child, your church, your community, anything, if you know someone's out there looking, even yourself, we are absolutely welcoming just to walk in Ask for the store director, the assistant, and they will take a minute and speak to you. So thank you for the time. Monique, I haven't met you yet. Gina, fantastic. Really look forward uh, to our partnership as we move forward. Thank you for the invite and the time this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you all for taking the time. I appreciate it. Um, you know, having grown up in the area that, that Safeway, we've seen it go through iterations. Glad to see that it's under new ownership and that you all are so vigilant in, um, in and recognizing what needs to be done and attacking. And that's the, just for those who might not know, that's the Swan Creek, uh, Swan Creek location um, in Fort Washington. Um, so thank you again and have an enjoyable rest of the evening. Thank you for joining us, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we actually have uh, Assistant Commander Captain Ralph Parker who will um, address some questions, actually him and Major Zachary O'Leary. Uh, we recognize from the chat that there has been noise disturbance at National Harbor. Um, it's my understanding that some of that noise uh, was related to perhaps even what we promoted as being an exciting evening um, or, or a trail of, of evenings of, of events, a uh, series of events at um, in July, the, the jazz festival. But clarify if that's not what it is. And we do wanna have um, at this time, Assistant Commander Captain Ralph Parker um, and uh, o Major O'Leary to address uh, these issues. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Assistant Commander Ralph Parker. I'm the Oxen Hill Division Four Assistant Commander. I was recently assigned and promoted there only two weeks ago. I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'll be putting my information into the chat. So if any of the panelists or anyone on the board, any members of the community would like to reach out and uh, touch base with me for any concerns that you have. I'm always available, my phone's always on. So I'd like to say thank you for having me. And uh, at the current time, I'll turn it over to Commander Major Zachary O'Leary to go forward from here. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my, name is, my name is Major O'Leary. Um, I, I will address um, the harbor, even though the harbor is, does not fall under division four, uh, it actually falls in our special operations division. Uh, I did actually speak to the captain, Captain Weingarner. Uh, he was recently transferred to uh, the assistant commander SOD and overlooking the harbor. We actually spoke today uh, about the noise uh, of the vehicles in the harbor, which I think is the complaint. Uh, and, and he's uh, working in operation with their traffic unit and with the officers who are assigned to the harbor, start cracking down on some of these uh, cars that have these loud exhausts. Uh, you know, I know in, in Division Four, we're also experiencing the same thing. Uh, Branch Avenue area. Uh, I think Mr. Robinson. I think I saw you on here over on um, um, behind the 7-Eleven off of Oxen Hill Road. Uh, so we're we're just trying to get officers out here. Uh, you know, I see more and more cars now with these loud exhausts, and I know. Uh, in the evening hours and late at night, uh, it's a real uh, pest. So we're just trying to get our officers to crack down on it and, and issue some uh, repair orders to see if these exhausts uh, are, are exceeding the limit. 
Uh, as far as District 4, uh, our crime is steady uh, this year. We're actually about even for the year. Um, what's, what's helping us is our property crime is down, which we struggled for years to try to get control of. Uh, what is hurting us right now is our violent crime is up. Uh, there is no rhyme or reason to why the violent crime is up. Um, but we are experiencing uh, an uptick in shootings as well in carjackings. Uh, the captain and I have been putting plans together for the past couple of weeks um, to address some of these hotspot areas in the district where we're seeing some crime uh, to hopefully uh, start decreasing the crime towards the end of the year. Uh, we'll talk briefly about an event that we're hosting next uh, Saturday, October 9th. That's the Faith in Blue. We have partnered uh, with the churches and division board division four to do a community walk from 800 block of Southern Avenue to the East Dover Shopping Center. Um, we have confirmed so far 26 churches in the Oxen Hill division are, are confirmed and are going to attend. Uh, we also have special guests such as uh, the Honorable Councilwoman Monique Anderson Walker, the County Executive, the Chief of Police, uh, Malik Aziz, uh, Chairman of Council Calvin Hawkins, uh, the Ward 8, uh, DC Ward 8, Councilman Trayon White, uh, and I believe that's it as far as our special guest. They'll be in attendance. Uh, when we get back to the East Dover Shopping Center after uh, our walk, we're going to have the Prince George County Police Band, which has in place in 2011. We've got two gospel bands that are going to be playing, as well as a uh, young DC 10 uh, year old female rapper, uh, as well. And we're going to have uh, horses, uh, pony rides for kids. We're going to have vaccination station. Uh, Carla Cash, who's on here, has been doing great as far as filling up our station with giveaways for masks and produce and hand sanitizer. Uh, we're going to have every county uh, entity there, such as DPI. Um, we're going to have DPI. We're going to have uh, OEM. We're going to have the fire department. Uh, every resource that you would need in the community uh, will be there. And the whole goal of this event is to uh, work with the faith-based community to break the biases and, and build on these bridges that we need uh, for the police department and lacking the trust that has uh, occurred over the past couple of years. So this event's going to be great. Please come out. Uh, I will put my email in the uh, chat as well. If you want a flyer, please uh, send me an email and I'll get you a flyer. Sorry for talking so fast and so long. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Um, I'm just trying to see if there are any questions directed to you at this time. I know that I did see one from uh, James earlier. Uh, the noise disturbance, let me just read it. Our neighborhood is plagued by, uh, comes from outdoor events at National Harbor, including South Point. Um, well, what, what we can do, James, is uh, connect you with National Harbor. We have your information, so we will follow up with you. Um, and, and connect you with um, those entities that I think can be most helpful in uh, dealing with this issue. We know as an office, we've gotten calls from National Harbor proper and have had several meetings here um, to address those. We've brought DPI in uh, because they're the violations unit. Those are the ones that come in and can, uh, we've, we've had the special police force as well to come in. Um, but ultimately, uh, the, the, it's really going to be kind of a day-to-day -day, um, uh, kind of a day-to-day -day situation because there's some days where the noise isn't there and then other days when we have these abrupt disturbances. Um, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that. So thank you for your, um, your question. And um, I see that Rob Parker has also put his telephone number in there so you can certainly follow up with him as well. But thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, the Henson Creek Village Area Planning Report. Um, we're going to give you a, a brief, uh, brief overview of what this is. Um, you, many of you, probably participated in our charrettes. We started in March of 2020. Uh, we actually, um, the focus was uh, or is to look at redevelopment opportunities of this uh, nearly 200 acre site. Uh, it's actually over 200 acres if you're looking within the yellow lines. If you're looking in the pink lines, that's uh, about 158 acres. But looking at redevelopment and uh, looking at the highest and best use for that site, 
um, so that uh, we can create something like a village, something vibrant, something that people, where people want to go, where they can um, have something to scale with regard to a downtown, more like a village, not quite a downtown, uh, but to scale that, um, that brings in the enhancements of the area, the nature, the creek, uh, you see the Henson Creek that's, that abuts it. And this area actually abuts historic Broad Creek as well. And we want to bring in these wonderful features because that's what makes us so special. Um, I want to go and tell you, you can move on to the next. Uh, we're in the process of editing uh, the report that's come through to make sure that all the comments that we have are addressed um, in that. Um, with any kind of development, what's so important is the environment. We don't want to do anything that's going to make it worse on us um, um, add to flooding, um, creating more impervious surface, impervious meaning that water can't get through it. Uh, that's blacktop, uh, that's taking down trees, uh, which stabilizes, stabilizes the soil. Uh, so we did have an opportunity, uh, Delegate Jay Walker of District 26 um, actually invited uh, Secretary of Natural Resources, um, Janie Hadaway Riccio, uh, to take a look at some challenged areas that we have in our waterways. Um, down at Captain's Cove, uh, the, the marina there, uh, it's a lot, there's a lot of silting that has taken place. And that has taken place because of irresponsible development. That's when you don't have a silt fence. Um, I'm not gonna go too far ahead other than to say that um, we are honored today to have the uh, si Assistant Secretary of Maryland Department of Environment with us, Suzanne Dorsey, um, who has gotten up to speed on some of the challenges that we're having and she's here to answer questions as well. I will let her introduce herself and again, thank you for being here. Good evening, good evening, uh, Councilwoman Anderson Walker and it, it is my um, privilege to be with you and your constituents um, today and um, on behalf of Secretary Benjamin Grumbles, who um, leads the Maryland Department of the Environment. And our, our mission there is to protect and to restore the environment for the health and well being of all Marylanders. And if you'll just give me a moment, I'm, I'm going to assume that um, many folks may know what Department of Natural Resources does in protecting our, our natural environments. But um, what, how is that different from Maryland Department of the Environment? Um, Maryland Department of the Environment um, has jurisdiction over permits associated with our built environment and we protect our built environment so that we also have a vibrant, sustainable, healthy, natural environment. So we are delegated by our federal government, the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. We have authority under those federal um, documents. Um, but we have priorities that have been set forward by Secretary Grumbles and, and all of us work in everything we, we do to address these priorities. Um, really, very first and foremost is our priority of environmental justice, recognizing that historic racism is real, recognizing that the impact on our communities is visible and that we have a duty to respond um, immediately and effectively. So we um, have environmental justice as a uh, priority for the Maryland Department of the Environment in everything that we do. Um, another uh, priority for the department is our commitment to addressing the impacts of climate change on all Marylanders. We recognize that some of our most vulnerable communities to uh, climate change are also environmental justice communities. So we also look at climate justice as a priority. The Maryland Department of the Environment oversees the Independent Climate Commission. Your state has the Maryland Commission on Climate Change. And uh, last year, an independent think tank rated uh, Maryland number one in the nation for combining carbon reduction with GDP growth. We do that using the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan and we have uh, very specific plans and targets with a clear sense of urgency to address climate mitigation, which means reducing uh, carbon uh, releases that, that cause climate change. Um, 
adaptation, getting ready for the changes that we know are here and are coming, and um, mitigation, and trying to avoid the damage that those changes will do. Um, we also have a priority of the cultural heritage that we all share along the Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay uh, restoration, again, impacts every part of our state. Um, it is an important cornerstone. We're global, mm -hmm. global leaders in protecting mm -hmm. our this incredible mm -hmm. national treasure. And we um, do that by starting with the local waterways. So where uh, our local waterways, the majority of our waterways in, in uh, Maryland do um, empty into the Chesapeake Bay, if we start by having clean, healthy local waterways, we can ensure that our Chesapeake is also clean. And finally, the last priority is customer service. So we want to make sure that we're responsive. Um, we want to listen, hear your concerns, and uh, respond as best we can with the rules and regulations that are under our jurisdiction. So one of the issues that I'm delighted to bring up, and I, I won't go into too much detail because probably not everybody on this call is as interested as I am, um, is the municipal separate storm water permit. So this is a permit under the Clean Water Act that we oversee for um, the counties. And it is a tool that we use to help you respond to issues around um, the water quality that comes off of those impervious surfaces that can Councilwoman Anderson Walker described. The, water, the, the quality of that water, that water can pick up toxins, it can pick up oils and other pollutants and bring that to your natural waterways. Um, we also recognize that um, flooding is also a result, particularly in our changing climate, of um, not keeping up with what's happening in our stormwater infrastructure. So we oversee permits and uh, PG County is um, working under an administrationally extended permit from 2014 and we expect to have a new permit for them next year, early next year. These permits reflect the Clean Water Act's newest iteration, which instead of looking at any one pipe, looks at a watershed. How do we not just um, deal with one point source of pollution, but how do we deal with a watershed? Where can we identify sources of flooding? How can we address it at the source and downstream where that flooding is, is impacting? The Maryland Department of the Environment does not actually do the work. We work with the county and we support the county with funding. We support the county with expertise and guidance, um, even as we get that same funding, expertise and guidance from the EPA. So we are very um, interested in supporting Prince George's County. You have a new um, acting director of your Department of the Environment, Andrea Crooms. She and I have had many conversations and will continue to bring forward holistic watershed-based strategies to make sure that we're protecting both the health of your natural waterways and the people who live there. And I'll just end with two important new um, items that we are bringing to your new permit. One is an, a real, fil uh, real focus on natural filters. And I'm, uh, I'm aware that uh, Councilwoman Anderson Walker is also interested in um, tree planting. Um, might I suggest humbly that we call it tree growing because we want to grow trees and let them do the important work that um, impacts our souls, but also cleans our air, cleans our water, and slows down flooding waters. So growing trees is an important new component uh, that we're asking counties to bring to help be one solution to address flooding and many other things. Um, but the second issue is a, a real focus on identifying areas that are currently flooding and maybe that are vulnerable to flooding and starting to put comprehensive plans that we can work collaboratively with you to address particularly vul vulnerable populations. So 
that's a little bit about what Maryland Department of the Environment does. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, well, air quality. Uh, yeah, there are a good number of questions there. Um, would you like to, uh, you probably have four back to back there. All right, um, you want, I'm, I'm just gonna start. Um, I, I see air quality, That that's a really important issue. Um, we have in the state of Maryland, uh, again, the Clean Air Act is also under our authority. We do have a network of air monitors. We're also working collaboratively with NGOs who are putting up these, um, what we call passive samplers and working very hard to make sure that communities have resources that they need so that we can be responsive to concerns. Um, so air quality is a priority for us um, and, and working collaboratively to ex um, extend our existing air quality monitors, we are actively working on that. Um, How the get Fort Washington Woods, um, these are the, the school, the school, you know, I, I wish I had an easy answer for you on, on the woods. The, the place where MDE was active on those woods is the permit, the early permit process where we require the county to have public meetings. Um, we have been on site. We've been on site um, frequently and we will continue to send inspectors as recently as yesterday. We had inspectors on site and they've improved some of the storm water um, infrastructure that they have in there uh, that they've got on the site. We do require that the um, site will have uh, storm water tools. And, and I, I, I suspect that the community members are, are with me that there's very little in this world that actually replaces trees. So I, I, Forgive me for saying this because I share your value associated with trees. And we also uh, do require that any site like this treat stormwater such that the quality of water coming off this site is equivalent to the quality of water coming off the forested site. Um, we are also doing our best to work with the county uh, to make sure that any flooding risk is mitigated. Um, but our ability to stop this after the permit has been issued, we don't, we don't have that authority. We have talked to our attorneys and to determine if we have any authority and we, we just don't. Um, let me see if I can get a few of those. Um, See, let's see something about air quality at the community. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, and the Swan Creek trees. Yeah, I'm I'm very I'm very sensitive to uh, the feelings of this community. I, I'm, you know, Councilwoman. I do you are you aware of the um, the public meetings, because according to my staff, there were public meetings associated with this. Um, I wasn't involved with the issue then, but that that was really the opportunity so I'll, I'll to just, put a halt to this. I just want to step in. Um, there weren't, there wasn't adequate transparency, which is part of the challenge here. Um, basically, people in the community learned about it. If you didn't attend or didn't have a child attending. Potomac Landing Elementary School, you didn't get the letter. Um, but the impact area are the people who actually live around it. So those are the people who should have gotten, uh, those, are, those are the stakeholders as well. Um, so the way that the information came to us is that a new school will be built and the information was, and we'll start taking trees down in July. So as soon as the community became aware of it, they reacted. So just to be very clear, people, want a new school. That is not the issue. The right. issue is that we have had unaddressed long time, long term flooding in the area, um, reflective of the infrastructure needing to be addressed. And that has not occurred. So the compound issue of removing 24 acres or 30,000 trees 
in an area where we already have evidence of destabilized soils. Just watch the news. There's been a lot of reports about um, Asbury and Hallwood Place that is notorious. A developer was able to come in, take all the trees off of the hill, uh, put a retaining wall and thought that that was enough. And what has occurred is that people at the bottom of the hill who fought the development, fought the removal of trees, lost. And as a result, they've been in their homes 35 years or more. Their backyard is shrinking because the slope is failing and it's pushing towards their homes. One home has been evacuated at the bottom of the hill, two homes evacuated on the top of the hill. Uh, the challenges that we have here are without question an equity issue. Uh, it's also a, a question of, um, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go as far as to say what I was going to say, but I will say that uh, the development lobby is very strong and um, uh, the opportunity for developers to get waivers when they should not receive a waiver. Example is Hallwood Place. That should not have been developed. A waiver was granted. Um, these things affect people. Uh, unfortunately, our, our laws in many ways don't protect people after the fact. So people's lives and their livelihoods are ruined. And more than that, properties are devalued. Um, if we go on, there's some other photos here that we might have with, that show silting. If you go back where Jay Walker is, the silting of, of a creek is a big deal. Um, the top left slides show the outflow of stormwater, um, uncontrolled. And we actually have video that I, I think we may have sent to you a couple of days ago of uh, what looks like a river running from the street through this person's backyard into uh, this inlet of the Potomac. As a result, their boat, uh, they have a boat that's on a lip, they cannot, they cannot launch. Um, the value, you know, they bought their house, the people pay a lot of money for houses in this area and to have waterfront properties, but it is, um, it's a slap in the face and it's, it's devalues. Uh, our homes, our investments, um, that is a crime. Uh, what people are asking for is intervene because once these trees are gone, that's it. Gina, if you go to the slide that shows um, the side-by-side -side of the 24 acre site, that's uh, the subject site, as well as, if you look to the right, that's the subject site. That's a 24 acre site, fully forested, fully forested. Uh, what you don't see is that this is at the intersection of Swan Creek and Fort Washington Road. Swan Creek has notorious flooding in that area. We have shown videos. When this came to our attention that this was going to be uh, built, uh, um, uh, the community rallied and, and showed um, video. Uh, what, what, else can we sh what else can we do to show proof that this is only going to make things worse? No matter how much silt fencing they put up here, the runoff is tremendous because our deluges are tremendous. And if you take out the stabilizing trees, then you're, you're, you're setting the community up for a catastrophe. And it's, um, one would think that there would, there would have to be an intervention when there's an understanding of the catastrophe that will come. When you look over on the left side, you see the potential for a 24 acre site. So you can still achieve 24 acres if that's the means, if that's the end that you want. Um, the current school site, this is a, a fifth through eighth grade school. Um, and this, the plan was to have this absorbed into the K through eight site. So essentially, you don't need to clear 24 acres if you already have 10 acres of cleared area, which is where the school is. And then you have it abutting Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Area, that uh, land that's 13.87 acres to me. Even if you clear 10 of these in order to keep, uh, not even 10, eight acres, so that you could have a nice buffer. If you're clearing eight acres and build a school there, and then when it's finished, have the kids that are over in the fifth through eight, move over into the building, have it active, knock down the current school location and make that into ball fields. To me, that makes sense. 
What's being done here, it may delay a school being built, but the school will be built and people won't suffer the way they're going to suffer with the removal of this 24 acres of trees. I've had conversations with Maryland National Capital Park and planning Bill Tyler. There is a process that would allow um, the county to, um, to get their hands on this land so that what I just mentioned could occur. Um, the time it wouldn't be tomorrow. And if, and if it's a, let's hurry up and get this done issue, then you know, we can't accomplish that. But I think it's worth, um, it's worth someone from the hires up taking, taking the time to say, hey, we know this is not normally what we do, step in, but we know Maryland Department of Environment is the only entity at this point that could do something. But what's happening well, is beyond. Well, what I've heard and I've written down and I'll, I'll take back and I'll ask staff to review is the, the public meeting that you were notified after the fact that adjacent neighbors were not notified. I will pursue that and, and get back to council, the councilwoman. Um, I, I um, again, encourage you to continue to work with the county. If the county um, chooses to stop this effort and responds to your community, then MDE will work with the county to um, look at other sites, um, address flooding issues. Um, we stand ready to support the community um, in addressing their flooding concerns. I hear you, uh, you want to address flooding concerns before they become um, you know, a, a serious problem. They already are a serious problem. You don't want to exacerbate that. Um, and we, we stand with you to support you in your addressing your concerns and, and raising those with the county. And um, Councilwoman Anderson Walker, I, you know, I, I will um, you know, attend any meeting with the county that you invite me to and um, use the technical knowledge of our department to support good decision making and support your, and if there is, any of the jurisdictional tools that we can bring to bear on this, um, you know, we will do so. But, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that your community is represented, that you have excellent access to technical tools. And, um, you know, we will work with you and the county to get to a resolution that, that you're looking for. I know that um, you are looking at the comments in here. You can feel the passion just reading, reading these comments from people. 100%. Listen, and, and when it's stated that we're told things after the fact, this is not unusual. This is part of what you mentioned earlier about uh, environmental racism. This is something that happens. This is, let's come in, do whatever we want to do over there and whatever, let them try to do something that we can't, we can't send a message that you can get away with that here because people will just continue to do that. And if it's not Maryland Department of Environment to step in, that it's not gonna happen because there's too much control um, down here by, uh, by people who don't necessarily uh, care about uh, the impacts on people as long as their bottom line is strong. And we can't, we can't have that. So we're, we're pleading with you. Uh, if, if the information you've, you found out is, is uh, something that could be, um, you know, change the direction um, with the knowledge that these people were not involved, um, please let that be the direction that we take. And, and, and listen, we, we, we got people who will rally to, um, to give you whatever information that you need to support, um, to support this, but um, this, is, this isn't right. This isn't right. And it's not a matter of, oh, we don't want a school. That's not it. We want a school. We've been very clear about that. It is the location. And wouldn't it make more sense to use a site that already has the infrastructure in place and just continue on a site where the infrastructure is there and you can still achieve without taking down as many trees? You know, you established earlier, trees cool areas. Uh, they mitigate water. They uh, bring value to homes and by, um, you know, by the other pop property, you look at it as taking away trees, it devalues homes. So we don't want to devalue the community. Um, yeah, and we know that planting saplings back 
they don't have 200 year old root systems, so they can't achieve what needs to be achieved. That can only be achieved by this, by what's here now. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Let's gonna move on to the next slide. Let me see if there's any, any other um, questions that might come up. Well, actually you might wanna stick around for this one, um, Assistant Secretary Dorsey. This, this is um, Andre Gingles um, is an attorney for a developer who is proposing to develop on a site, um, uh, actually to change the, the density of the zoning through a text amendment from um, rural residential, so farmland, to uh, to industrial uses on the site. Um, uh, the site. I will. I will let him come on and speak about what he is. Pro what's being proposed here, and um, the bill is CB seventy eight. Uh, one of the bills is CB78, the other is uh, the CR87, which is a WSSC category change from a five to a three. Um, Ms. Dorsey, do you want to explain a little bit about what a category change is and how that might impact things, or is that not really your purview? Yeah, probably not. By That's a planning and zoning issue. Right. So, but the, the Category changes, um, imagine this, look at the farmland that's here. Uh, the reason that it's in a category five is because it was never intended to be developed be beyond this, the impact that you currently see. Right, and, and here, here's, if, if you switch that to very highly impervious surface, I will tell you that your county is required by our, our stormwater permit to have a, a certain level of impervious surface restoration. Um, and, and I will put it, um, I'll be, I'll try to be delicate. PG County is not leading the state in impervious surface restoration. So there is significant pressure mm -hmm. on your county to ensure that um, if you do develop property, that you have to also be uh, treating or restoring, if not that site, some other site, site with things like um, green filters. Um, you can use uh, technology like infiltration ponds, but um, restoring forest is a wonderful way to address that. Uh, but I, I, I do, I can speak to the impervious surface component. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you again. And uh, Mr. Gingles, will you join us and speak a little bit on the uh, proposed bill, uh, CB78, an ordinance concerning solar powered renewable energy facility and warehouse and distribution uses in the rural residential zone for the purpose of uh, defining solar powered renewable energy facility in the zoning ordinance and amending the table of uses in the zoning ordinance to permit solar powered renewable energy facility and warehouse and distribution uses in the rural residential zone of Prince George's County. When the warehouse and distribution use is particularly or partially powered um, by renewable energy under certain circumstances. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Gaines. Good evening all. Um, and I uh, had the good fortune. I just need to close my door because the folks have come in to do some things. I don't want to disturb us. Apologies. Um, so uh, first off, um, I heard you discussing the category change and I would just make one um, slight um, clarification. Uh, so the categories that are listed for water and sewer changes and actually in the actual resolution, category five doesn't mean that uh, a property is not supposed to be developed. It's further back in development. It essentially means that the public water and sewer is in the area, but is not connected to the property. And so in order to move forward eventually uh, to make those connections, it does have to go into category four. And uh, as you noted, uh, parts of this property are in for the category change to category five. So this property, uh, which is about 200 acres and the, the red line outlines the property. 
is just north of what used to be Rosecroft, or is actually still Rosecroft, but doesn't operate anymore. As you can see, it has some very nice natural buffers. And by that, what I mean is that the tree stands are actually, in many cases, on the edge of the property in the sense that those are the tree stands that are next to uh, existing residential development. The property is zoned uh, so that it would be developed under the RR zone for somewhere between 430 units, or if you do the master plan zoning or the master plan proposal that's in the sector plan, it would actually be closer to about 700 dwelling units. And under that, what they want us to do is a mix of dwelling units. Um, Property's been there for probably about 15 years because I think the master plan was done right around 2006 when that um, suggestion of a suburban village came forward. And we've never really thought that with a fair amount of residential that's already proposed or going into the region, particularly with uh, residential impacting probably two things fairly significantly, uh, recreation facilities and school facilities, that we didn't see really the need to do another large suburban uh, residential subdivision in the area. One of the things, and I was um, appreciated your initial presentation, Council Member, and you really talked about a lot of the amenities, uh, the concentration on serving the health needs, in the recreational needs of the community. We think that residential in particular probably has the greatest impact on uh, trying to provide those additional amenities, uh, health services, and particularly with regard to recreation. As you know, uh, while residential does have a surcharge uh, for both public safety, for every dwelling unit that's built, as well as for schools, um, I think that the council has found over the years that those surcharges don't always add up so that the school capacity and the number of classrooms and space uh, is held such that those are adequately provided. And it's for that reason that we've always looked at this property. Uh, again, it's a large property. It's down uh, with close proximity to uh, 495. We've looked at what could be other potential uses. Um, one of the things that the county has been looking at that has occurred in other parts of Maryland, as well as in Virginia, are power purchase agreements as different jurisdictions have looked at ways, uh, particularly using solar, to uh, incentivize folks to um, create renewable energy and uh, that sort of brings about favorable electricity rates for jurisdictions, also uh, provides a way for those jurisdictions to lock in uh, their power costs over time. Uh, we were looking at one particular uh, power purchase agreement that was done in Fairfax County, where under that agreement, they're gonna probably be able to produce uh, the energy that would normally be consumed by 200,000 plus homes in a year. So as we've also looked at uh, the, commer the commercial, excuse me, the permits from out of District 8, while there's a lot of permits still being issued, the majority of those permits aren't for new, what we would consider to be employment uses. Um, there's still a lot of traffic where folks who live in the district travel outside the district for their employment. And so with those things in mind, we've looked at what might be an appropriate employment use uh, that we could combine uh, so that it would be done um, in what I would consider a, a post 2020 outlook in terms of how you provide power to uh, various developments. And so this area we think would be an attractive area where we would come in and do an employment use that would be uh, distribution and warehouse. Uh, we would also do it uh, in conjunction with solar. Uh, and the solar would power, the, first of all, the solar goes to the entire grid. And so 
the user that would be there would be able to purchase that power off of the grid. It could also be purchased by uh, other entities, including the county. Most of where you see solar powered um, facilities now, they're essentially on roofs every now and then. You'll see them on the parking lots for different buildings. Uh, but the investment that's needed to actually produce the larger facilities so that the grid can actually have power and uh, have power available for a number of users is the result of doing a facility that we think would be of this size. Um, this development would also, uh, or and actually any development that would come there, whether it was residential or something like what we're proposing, would ultimately need to do some transportation improvements in the area. Uh, one of the things we think about doing a development uh, such as we're proposing is that the trips that are associated with, let's just say somewhere between the, the low end of 400 and the high end of about 700 homes, that the trips that would come from doing the employment uses, one would be less trips, particularly during the peak hours. And two, um, we think that the property tax base that would also be generated from doing that type of development uh, allows for those property taxes to go more to the uses that are not um, the public facilities, i.e. schools and recreation. Um, the legislation is uh, just sort of starting through the process. So I do appreciate the opportunity. Uh, while we've been able to discuss this over the past two years with you, um, I do appreciate you providing this opportunity so that we can begin to share it with the community. Uh, we've actually uh, begin um, identifying some of the associations, particularly the associations that border the property and uh, would be commencing some outreach, but I, I, I just think this is a great opportunity to sort of talk about it in general. So that's it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, I can answer any specific questions if anyone has them, but essentially um, it would probably be a facility um, that again would probably produce less of a footprint than if we did the homes that we are allowed to do by right, um, would probably generate more tax revenue with less impact on public facilities and would also probably provide for more transportation improvements, particularly along Brinkley Road and where Brinkley Road begins to intersect over with Oxon Hill and that sort of um, phalanx of uh, intersections that run along there. Um, and just so that I'm doing it correctly, if you'll just direct me to what questions you want me to respond to, I'll go from it from there. Okay. I see a lot still talking about the school, um, the school site. Um, are there questions related to this particular? So Angela Malone, it is good. Yes, we, so we have, what we try to do, the council, I'm sorry, the clerk's office keeps a list of registered homeowner associations and community groups in the area. And so we try to identify those and, and we've identified probably eight to 10. And then we also try and identify how, how active they in have they sort of put in. And then we, we have a group that's going to be outreaching to those folks as we go through this. All right, so we have a question. What is the benefit to residents of the county? With the so, size and configuration of the panels, sure. what's going in the warehouse and distribution centers? Okay, um, I'm sorry. One, one more, say the first one again, Councilman. Uh, it's Jocelyn Smith Schmidt Jones question. Mm -hmm. It's at the third from the bottom. What is the benefit to residents of the county? Yeah. So um, three, well, whenever we're looking at, particularly as we look at employment, we're looking at, um, and as we look at employment within districts, can you create employment so that you're creating jobs that are very proximate and of the type of jobs that are proximate to location? There's a lot of travel, particularly within the eighth district and you folks who travel up and down Indian Head Highway already know this, where people are traveling outside the district to 
uh, places of employment. Uh, our desire to sort of do an employment use versus a residential use is to really try and create some jobs there in the district. Uh, the employment uses tend to generate more property tax revenue than um, homes, and they decrease the impact on um, public facilities, particularly schools, uh, the request for public safety. Uh, all development should, and this development would, um, needs to address uh, traffic impacts. And so the appropriate transportation improvements uh, would have to be done regardless of what time the development is. But we would note that we think that um, a development that's an employment use is gonna be able to probably provide for more transportation improvements than if it was just done residential, particularly because the residential gets done over time and the employment use tends to go in all at once. I'm gonna still let you direct questions to me, council members. Yeah, and just give us a minute. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I'm looking at a question here. I was not aware that we have a great need for warehouses in this area. Livingston so, Road. Um, I think most people will, well, I shouldn't say most, I say a lot of folks, and, and I don't do this as much as Mrs. Gingles and my daughter and other folks I know, but a lot of folks, which has particularly increased during the pandemic, um, do a lot more shopping online. And uh, what we refer to as last mile delivery is um, a growing effort to locate, uh, particularly as same day delivery becomes more prevalent, mm -hmm. uh, locations where businesses can <laughs> either the same day or overnight. Uh, brick and mortar stores are on the decrease for a lot of reasons. Um, particularly during the pandemic, uh, you saw a lot of that. And so the um, use that we believe uh, and the use is being looked at in other areas of the county as well, as well throughout this area is the, um, the type of uh, what we call warehouse distribution that are for um, particularly retailers that do a lot of delivery uh, directly to residents and businesses. So will this be an Amazon warehouse? That's one of the questions. Um, we don't and don't have a user that we can talk about now. There are at least three or four that, um, and, and you keep noticing more and more folks who are uh, getting into online uh, consumer purchases as well as delivery. Um, and so I would tell you that it's it, it will be of the folks who are doing online purchasing and delivery. All right, and someone had asked a question, where is this located? So I don't know, if you don't know where Rosecroft is, then maybe you know where Sharper's Florist is on Brinkley Road. And, and, and I'll just sort of say, one of the great things we do think about this property, you can see where a fair amount of the property is already graded out. And again, as I noted, the buffers are on the edges. Uh, and so, we think that there's the ability to save a lot of that existing buffer um, and, and sort of place the, what is going to be the actual development uh, into a lot of the area that's already been graded out. If you guys have been in this area, you know there are, there's, um, it's sort of a, right where you have the, where it says redevelopment, just a little bit above that, with sort of the high point that's in there. And, and a lot of it is a low point from there. Uh, let's, let's deal with people's questions. And, and you, you kind of understand where my perspective has been, um, Mr. Gingles, we've talked about it several times so that you know, my preference would have been for you to wait until Army Corps of Engineers conducts their flood assessment study of the county um, so, that we, in, so, that, in, we to, so yes. that we know how to proceed. Um, and that we develop in an intelligent way. Um, I, I will let people know that I denied the category change in the last cycle, because once the category change takes place, that means development can take place. At this point, no development can take place because um, what would be coming up as CR 87, um, that is something, if it, if it is to move forward, uh, which, which moves, category from a category five to a category three, then development can take place. 
category four is actually where we would go and you have renewed that request to us and that's a request that's under consideration as we noted that the, it's, it's the already development been. process is a long process and so there there we are considering your request to withdraw moving forward with that category change at this time particularly if we're able to still move forward with at least starting the process for the zone well, you know, the, the, the agreement that I thought we had made was we wanted to go through the Army Corps of Engineers evaluation, and I did not want to ask you not to put in for this category change out of respect for the process that the community wants, and that's needed. Um, so when you put in not only the category change, but also... We didn't put one in, by the way, Council. It, it's in. It's no, in. no, I'm, I'm saying we didn't put it in. It's an automatic rollover that you have. Well, we had we have to... We have to withdraw it at the time of the public hearing. We had a conversation months ago, well before this was put in. So no, I'm not. We, I'm, I'm just. I just want to be clear. We did not request the category change. And, and it's and an automatic rollover. And I want to be clear. You and I had a conversation this well before this automatic rollover took place. So let's just. I want to be very um, transparent to the community with how I operate. I'm. I'm very straightforward. Um, I'm respectful of developers because I believe that you all. Uh, do some wonderful things, but uh, I'm respectful of the community because there's a recognition that we've been hurt as a result of uh, processes moving forward uh, that should not. Um, and so I, I, I just want to, to state that um, this, this bill was put in. Now, typically when there's something that's gonna impact your area, you put the bill in, but this, this bill was put in by, um, by the council chair. But I do want people listening to know that they have an opportunity to participate in the hearings to either determine or argue that they want this because it might be something that they want for the community or that they don't want it. And that's for CB 78 2021 as well as CR 87 2021. Um, there's a question here from Juliet Walker. Uh, so that means big truck, big rig trucks constantly coming in and going, coming and going, and more carbon emissions permeating the air as a result. Um, so there are deliveries done by the larger trucks, the trucks that tend to leave the site that are delivering or to consumers or businesses or the smaller trucks. Uh, most trucks are starting uh, over a period of time and particularly the larger retailers that are doing these facilities are moving to electric fleets, frankly. Okay, any other questions that are coming in? Uh, Gina, do you have the document to show? The slide? Lisa, can you put it up? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, not that one. The one that Hugo might just sent to you? Hugo just sent it. Okay. Uh, I think there was a couple other questions maybe too. That, did you get to all of the questions, Councilman, while she's loading no. that up? If you can read them all for me, Gina, that'd be great. Okay, we go back up. I saw Ron Weiss had a few questions about the warehouse. Um, Claire, can you find that one? Because my screen. Carla, <laughs> whoever finds it first. The one before the Amazon one, he's there. So you propose a solar farm and a warehouse or is it a warehouse with a solar panel on the roof? Solar farm and a warehouse. And Ron question was trucks will impact, well statement was trucks will impact the beltway interchange and will require a major expenditure to accommodate them. There will be, I, I, I couldn't tell you all of the transportation improvements that will be necessary. The majority of them will be along Brinkley Road as Brinkley Road moves from, I'm sorry, just one second. probably from Brinkley Road around Glen Rock Avenue, moving kind of northwest toward Oxon Hill Road. And there could be potentially um, 
modifications uh, even to the interchange. Yes. Is this the same warehouse that was proposed for Westphalia? No, that actually was uh, what was called a, um, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but it was about an 800,000 square foot warehouse. I actually uh, know the area where they're looking for that now, but it's not this word. No. And so for clarity, it looks like this Brinkley proposed use is, is a delivery station of 219,000 square feet, a data center of 377,700 square feet, and a solar farm of 60 acres. So the um, that's an old concept that we shared with you when we were discussing, uh, the county had just recently, as you know, adopted legislation to um, uh, look for potential data centers and location in part because they don't generate any traffic. They have, as has occurred in Loudoun County, um, significant uh, property tax um, um, revenue for the counties. Uh, this area actually doesn't have yet the uh, power infrastructure to allow for data centers. And so uh, that was on the original concept that we showed you when we met with you, that's why it was there. There's one other question, Gina was, yeah. so, you're, so you propose a solar farm and a warehouse or is it a warehouse with a solar panel on the roof? Not the latter, the yeah. former. He answered that one already. There's one more, and uh, we're going to ask everybody, please use the chat box. We're not using the Q&A. Uh, has a scientific medical impact report or assessment been made regarding potential health concerns of residents who live in or near the community where the proposed facility will be built? Um, so solar farms have been studied by the state. There are a variety, of, and, and they've studied the impacts as well. Um, both the state and the county are now uh, doing a, a variety of investment uh, incentives uh, in order to move away from the old power grid of electricity to having more of the electrical and power needs generated by solar. Um, and the studies that have um, sort of gotten both the state and the local governments, and you probably saw within the infrastructure bill uh, being done by now by Congress are some huge incentives, again, to promote the use of solar for the power grid. Um, so the, the studies have essentially shown no real uh, impact, and uh, it is considered to be the clean energy of the 21st century, and I think there's going to be more and more done. Uh, the, the county has, over the last 10 years, tried to promote uh, the development to date because of the expense that's involved, most of them have just been either on the top of buildings or as I've noted before, uh, parts of parking areas. So, it, and this is just a, um, a concept because you don't have any stormwater management um, here. So this must just be a concept, right? And, and the, the proposed solar farm is like gray kind of angled yes. shade. Um, you know, I always thought solar farms were, had just a bunch of pervious surface under them. I didn't realize that, uh, you know, you had to grade and pack and, um, and sometimes even pour concrete so that the, uh, those can fit into a, uh, a sturdy grid. So essentially just, just from, and this is just a visual, but it looks like a considerable amount of, um, of impervious surface. Do you know how much impervious surface you all are calculating? And would you be asking for a waiver to allow for the maximum uh, to maximize beyond? I wouldn't expect that we would need a waiver, but we haven't moved uh, that far in the concept yet. Mm -hmm. um, there are various ways uh, with regard to the solar phone. We do know that it doesn't pro provide I guess the one thing that we know just from our um, preliminary studies is, is that it's much less of an impact that we would have if we sort of built out a subdivision with the existing zone. 
but it's this is our R, so that's what one house per acre. So yeah, so well, okay. but we're we're actually master plan as a suburban village, so that the density goes up to about three point seven uh, per acre, and so about 430 under the regular zoning and it begins to approach uh, 700 if we do the suburban village. And, and that master plan was established like when? And is it? It's the 06. Yeah, so that's, you'd have to take a few steps to get to that density. But as it stands, the underlying zoning allows one. 430. Uh, the underlying zoning allows 430, is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, so is this RR or is it? It is not? RR. Okay, but you're saying because it's master planned? No, no, so RR is 20, that's the uh, 20,000 square foot okay. lots on about 215 acres, which we roughly are, it's about 430. And, and that is, uh, if that's developable, 100% developable area, if any of, a, if it is, you know, um, wetlands or floodplain, then it's not a developable. Well, well, you still get that yield because uh, you can cluster and reduce the livestock. Well, that's if, if that's allowed. A cluster is not an automatic. Yeah. That's um, that's something that has to go through a process. Um, uh, okay. But my, well, you know, just my understanding. Uh, but, okay. but, you know, regardless, we're looking at um, impervious surface area. Now, let me ask you this. The, the solar farm here, which looks like it's huge with this whatever is proposed to be, um, where does the energy go? So the energy uh, goes into the grid and mm -hmm. then is uh, powered, uh, excuse me, then almost any consumer can buy the power, but typically in this instance, uh, our potential users uh, like the idea uh, as they have, they're all looking at moving toward cleaner power sources and having that uh, power there, they would enter into potential contracts for it. Uh, the county's also looking um, to, to, to the potential of entering into the power purchase agreements uh, as other jurisdictions are doing throughout the state of Maryland as a hedge against the increase in uh, power costs over time. So it goes on to the grid um, and it can be purchased by uh, any normal user and consumer of energy. Oh, so you're not storing the energy anywhere and then using it to- well, it is, yeah, Yes, hardware. it is stored. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it is stored and it goes on to the grid, but it's, a, it's available by, if you have a power purchase agreement, uh -huh. it, it gets held for whomever has those power purchase agreements. And it's stored on site? Well, it's not, it's not actually stored on site. It's a, it's, it's on the grid, which is out there. Okay. So I'm, I'm not, I mean, I want to tell you that I'm an electrician, but it, it's, it's not like it's sitting there on site. Okay. I'm just asking because there's something else that's going on in that area. And we're, we're all trying to figure out if it's all part of the same plan. Um, I know that at one point there was discussion about um, the need for redundancy. Um, and electricity on the site, uh, if you were to have a data center, which is common to have redundancy in case there's a failure of one that you have your own um, uh, power. Uh, is it a transmitter or what is it called? And forgive me, I, I don't remember the, the lingo, but um, but it, it's, is there a, a plan to work with PEPCO to get a reservation for a um, a transmitter, and that might be the improper um, term, this, but the this does not have power. anything to do with Pepco in terms of building any transmitter. No. Okay. All right. So that's not proposed on the site. No. Okay. But you would need that if you had a data center. Um. It wouldn't necessarily have to be on site, but it would have to be the, the, there would have to be a sufficient amount of power proximate to that location, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excuse me, I just need to uh, turn on. The smart lights, they're so smart, <laughs> they turn off. All right, let's see if there's other questions. Uh, my screen is set up so I can't even look at the chat. Maybe one of you all can. 
council member. Jocelyn Smith, Smith Jones has a question. Does any power purchase agreements have to be approved by the Maryland Public Service Commission? <laughs> Yes, if we're of a certain, well, I'm not sure if the power purchase agreements have to be approved, but when you reach a certain size in terms of a um, solar power facility, uh, you, you probably, you have to be approved by the power, uh, excuse me, by the Public Service Commission. Ron Rice has, how much will it cost DPWNT to upgrade Brinkley Road and does the developer pay for the upgrades? So um, under the county ordinance, uh, the developer would be doing most of the intersection and road widening improvements along Brinkley Road since it's the frontage of our property. And Mike Little asks, what is the community at large benefit of this concept? So, and I noted um, earlier, we think um, uh, having employment uses as opposed to building more houses benefits the community in terms of putting jobs in the community so that uh, folks are not always going out the community. We think of having employment uses as opposed to more houses reduces the uh, impact on schools and particularly public safety. While there are surcharges uh, that would come if you build um, homes that could be used for that. Um, over time, we, and I think that's why they continue to increase because they don't always um, uh, bring that capacity on in time. Also, uh, because um, an employment use sort of goes up all at once, um, the ability to sort of do the transportation improvements all at once as opposed to in tranches as the residential development comes online uh, becomes more beneficial, we also think to the community. And then one more question from Ron Weiss, is the current concept package available to the public? Uh, there, this was, um, I mean, to the extent I would, the only thing I would do is because the data center um, is no longer proposed and because it can't be done with a certain power grid, if, I, if Mr. Um, Cantu or the council member wanted to utilize that in terms of providing it to the public, we would just want to provide them the correct uh, sheet there. Um, just a couple of con um, comments. One's from Robert Monroe. He says, yikes at this entire idea. I would recommend two alternative solar farm sites and 20744, which are closed landfill parallel to 210NB and the still open Palmer Road landfill that is reaching capacity within the next couple of years. These, site, these alternative sites will be utilized as it is closed landfill site. Uh, the panorama of Maryland. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read it. Uh, I think it says that Rosecroft is a beautiful area that should be left unde undeveloped, modernized to what exists and or very smartly developed. Uh, interesting so, points. Just on the, those two comments, uh, this doesn't, in, we're, we're not proposing to do anything on the Rosecroft side, um, which was the second comment. On the first one, um, I don't know about those property. I know that particularly with regard to landfills, they have to be re vegetated no that's not the word they have to uh, there's a there's amount of cleanup and other things that have to occur before they can actually be used even for certain industrial uses okay and one more comment um james yesanowski he says impervious surfaces from solar farm will result in runoff to Henson Creek Trail, which already has flooding problems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we'll, and then Barbara. Our, we do have requirements, uh, both county and state requirements uh, regarding um, how to treat stormwater and runoff 
Uh, I've been involved in a fair amount of development uh, in the county. Uh, the 2013 uh, changes to the stormwater management um, ordinance at both the state levels and then what the county also implemented in 2017 uh, particularly have been helpful in areas where a lot of the development predates um, stormwater management regulations. And a, a lot of the problems that are in the southern portion of the county are the result of stormwater management regulations not being in place when a number of those homes were built. One of the things that comes about as a result of the new development, uh, and particularly after the changes in 2013, was the need for new development to essentially um, take into consideration and um, add additional, excuse me, additional systems to address some of the proximate areas to the newly developed properties for which there was no stormwater management. Um, and, and part of that would occur here. Um, Barbara Huffer asks, how will this affect traffic going to Rosecroft Raceway? So I thought it was closed. Councilman? Oh, I, I guess is it, per, is it uh, permanently closed or is it uh, oh, I don't know. I, I, okay. Well, I thought it was closed. So I'm not sure what, what we would do to that traffic, but we will have transportation improvements to do along um, uh, that center road that sort of runs through there as well as Brinkley Road and then various intersections in order to maintain uh, the statutory level of service that's required. And John Oldenburg has a, he just makes a statement, just a guess, but it seems most of the power generated will go to the data center and warehouse, no benefit for the community. No, actually, um, well, the data center, again, I will, I will hopefully, um, um, Hugo, I will get you of the right exhibit so that the potential data center is off of there. But um, the, Warehouse couldn't use 100, cannot use 100% of the power that would be um, generated by the solar farm. There's going to be an, an enormous amount of that that's going to go onto the grid and would be able to be purchased either by governments or other folks with purchase agreements. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and uh, we just have to move on because time is, well, you know, we're coming to the end. Um, thank you thank so much. Uh, Mr. Gingles, I'm mm -hmm. sure people have questions and we will make sure if you all put your um, emails in the actually use your emails to log on. We will get your emails and send out uh, information so that if you choose to come to the hearing to uh, give your statement on um, your support or, or, or concern, um, we will welcome that. I do want to mention it, it came up that the landfill should be used. Uh, uh, the landfill at Palmer Road, we just voted to close that landfill. And uh, the time frame of the last dump on that site will be um, May 30th, May 20th. So um, uh, at, uh, at the time, once that takes place, uh, there is a process um, we're actually working with MDE to get an idea of what that process is. And DPI, oh, reclamation. Uh, I couldn't think of the word. Reclamation. Reclamation. reclamation that's it. Um, that process, I'm not quite sure how long it'll take, but that will, um, uh, the, the person who made the comment is absolutely right. Uh, that, that landfill is done and that's wrapping up. So there will be opportunities for uh, something like solar, solar to be placed there. And that, you know, may be a more appropriate uh, Not on a reclaimed site, but no. Uh, and, and it's proximate. But, uh, but thank you again. We do appreciate your time and, um, and staying with us to answer questions uh, as well. Uh, Always a you. pleasure, Councilman. And uh, thank you much uh, for your staff uh, helping me um, work through this. Thank you again. Okay, we'll move on to uh, the next slide, which is PEPCO. A PEPCO storage facility, which is being uh, proposed in a 2019 bill uh, that passed the state, it was 
recommended that there be an evaluation of uh, put a pilot program in place to see how battery storage facilities might work here. Now, generally battery storage facilities store energy from solar panels. Um, from solar panels and this particular location, can we, can we get that up on the screen? That should be slide 26, slide 26. This particular, uh, we've been in discussions with PEPCO um, and a small group of citizens uh, for the past probably six to nine months. And forgive me, time these days is a blur. But we will have another meeting and we would love for you all to come. Um, that meeting will take place on October 15th at noon. Is that right, Gina? Is it noon? Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, we want your input. The slide, which hopefully you'll see shortly, shows the battery storage uh, facility. What is, um, what's unusual about the battery storage facility is that um, we've learned that lithium battery fires cannot be put out in any traditional way. So uh, in our CAG meetings, our citizen advisory group meetings, we've, we've had leadership from um, fire safety come in and tell us, yeah, we can't put out this fire. <laughs> um, that's, it's a lithium, uh, and lithium tends to burn hotter as well. So there, there are concerns just from the, the control aspect, uh, what happens in the event that there is a, um, a fire? It, it appears that it would have to consume. Um, but listen, uh, this is my understanding. Um, I wanna invite you all to participate in this uh, citizen advisory group meeting, which will take place on the 15th and ask questions. Um, what was interesting in, in listening is that our, uh, this is to be built to store energy. And um, the question, of course, I had was, how is this going to reduce our bills? <laughs> and they said, it will not reduce your bills. And I said, oh, well, I guess you're putting this battery storage facility here so that you don't have to put up that um, controversial um, transformer, and I might be wrong, transformer, transmitter, um, Pepco, I think it's a transformer, um, around the CVS on Oxon Hill Road. Um, and if you've been following that for years, it's, it's, it's been um, a concern because of um, magnetic, yeah, the magnetic um, effect on, on the human body and the proximate uh, location to dense housing. Anyway, so th those were two things that were of interest. Um, the thought was, oh, well, maybe this will take the place. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more insulated. Um, but no, there, there will be a transformer that will be still built. It just might be five years down the road. Um, so with this facility, battery storage um, facility, we're, we're just eager to find out what is the benefit to the community. Um, the, uh, our representative, uh, Tammy Watkins, has been um, um, very vocal on this and um, I invite you to participate in finding, uh, getting answers uh, as well, your answers. Don't, I don't want you to be swayed by me, but I do want you to have all the details so you know what's happening in your area and that nothing sneaks up on you. Um, my understanding is that this will come in a bill form in October uh, for, for support. And so this is something that you need to be aware of and have to feel comfortable with. If we had zoomed out a little bit, you'd be able to see that um, this is in, um, it backs up, it's on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Livingston Road by St. Columba Church on that same road. Uh, it backs up to Oxon Hill High School and uh, housing, uh, housing community. Uh, so you need to just be aware of it. So this is for awareness. We can move on to the next slide. I'm sorry, Councilwoman. Uh, One correction, it's 11 a.m., not 12. 11 to on October 15th, thank you. Okay. And we will collect your emails and send uh, an invite to you so that you have the option if you'd like to join. This gives you a better view of um, the site. So where the, the, the um, blood orange um, outlined area is, is the proposed area. And you, you can see the housing that's all around it. Um, and 
it it's not too far from the site we just uh, we just looked at. FYI. You want to go to the next slide? Okay. At this time, um, Hugo Cantu, who who is the <clears throat> excuse me policy analyst for uh, my office. Council, I'm sorry. We had some questions on Pepco. Did you want to address those first? Um, I don't know that I can. Okay. But invite you to to come and get those from uh, from people who have actual answers. I can tell you what my understanding is, which I just did. Um, but I invite you to go deeper and, and, and get satisfaction that your, your questions are thoroughly answered. October 15th at 11 a.m. Um, you can. Everybody can look at the chat. There were a few statements that, that people made, so that's fine. I'm sorry. Okay. And we'll um, take those statements to the meeting. Excellent. Uh, and I just, you know, I want to say thank you uh, before I forget to my staff because they're brilliant and um, they're tireless. <laughs> I've got to mention them. Carla Cash, thank you so much. You are uh, the constituent service person with the mostest. So thank you so much. Claire Britt Cochram, who is the newest one um, on our team. Uh, she and Talisha Farmer, the newest one, my legislative aide, um, Claire Britt Cochram. And I'm excited to have you, Talisha, who is kind of working double duty. She is a constituent services uh, and legislative administrator. So she's, she's taking it all in. And of course, Gina Anderson Ford, thank you for setting this up. And thank you for all the public relations and outreach that you do. Hugo Cantu, who you cannot see, um, is my policy analyst. And hopefully, he will be speaking soon. So even though you can't see him, I hope that you get to hear him. This will, uh, he's going to go through some legislation that we've um, been successful in getting passed and some legislation that's upcoming um, that you should definitely follow and uh, participate in hearings to either support or if you don't like it, don't support it. Um, you can see him now. He's. Hugo, are you, are yeah. you there? Okay. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you, council member. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to, to work for District 8. Um, and, you know, thank you to the team. It's, a, it's been a very big effort, um, you know, obviously not only today, but since, uh, since uh, we've been in this pandemic and obviously since, obviously since the council member has been in office. Um, and some of the things that we've been able to do, obviously, uh, outside of our initiatives, but we've been able to, to present uh, co-sponsor, sponsor, and pass uh, several pieces of legislation. Um, and so what you see right now is something called uh, uh, CR7, that's uh, Council Resolution 7 uh, on acts of insurgency. And so we all know that, you know, uh, with the attempted insurrection on January 6th of, um, of uh, 20, I think it was 2021, actually. <laughs> it was this year. I think it's all been this year. Um, we've all been in the same year. And so, um, you know, when it happened, obviously everyone was, uh, had, had many, many feelings and, and something that we were able to do was bring all of the council members together and uh, put in a resolution that so, showed uh, not only support uh, to our county executive, um, but also that we wanted to press the fact that what was happening was going to, is, was used and, you know, obviously suppress and, and, and take the votes away from, uh, uh, voters of color, and we are a county of majority uh, people of color, and that's how we should le legislate. And so that was something that we were very proud of doing. Um, and, you know, possibly directing investigations for for public servants that may have taken part in the violent insurrection, and that was absolutely key. Um, so we're very happy to, to have done that. Um, as you can see, you know, CR 29, which is Council Resolution 29, um, this is something that we have been uh, fighting for quite some time. And, and as you have been hearing and obviously seeing and experiencing the tremendous amounts of flooding, uh, stormwater uh, management uh, issues, uh, this is a resolution that is directing the United States Army Corps of Engineers to uh, find and uh, promote uh, and do a study on what's happening in this area and in, uh, in our district. Um, and I've you know, seen some comments in the chats about uh, 311 
And I, you know, really like to urge that 311 is a tool that we use. It's a tool that I use. Um, it's a tool that the Department of the Environment uses in referencing, you know, why we need certain things done. And so I, um, I use that tool. I use what we what we find and what is reported. Um, and just, you know, between February of 2018 and February 2021, we have received uh, as a county over uh, 2,400 uh, reports of flooding issues, stormwater management issues um, uh, at the county level. And, you know, I think uh, District 8 is uh, first or, or, or very close uh, to first um, and having the highest amount of, of 311 calls. And that's something that we use in legislation, in, in committee. This is something that is a tool for the council members disposal when we are speaking of uh, why we need certain things done. Um, and this is something that we're really excited about having. Um, and I can answer any question in the chat. 311 should be called in if there's flooding. Y yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so 311, um, and Carla can probably speak more to, to exactly what 311 is used for, but I know that I use what the Department of the Environment has reported in, in drainage complaints and drainage issues and stormwater management issues, because again, stormwater management is under the, the, the authority of the county, um, as we've heard the Assistant Secretary mention, um, and so this is something that is a tool that we use in, in figuring out what is what is needed and what what solutions we can help uh, find and implement. And I hope that answered that question. So with 311, just to, um, before you go, we know that it's not the best tool and we know that sometimes things don't get addressed, but if you put in your 311 ticket and then email me or text me the service request number, we can assist with following up so that you all aren't getting the runaround, but it's the way that they track, it's the way that they, you know, do, they can utilize for budgeting for different services that we have that are backlog. So again, it's not the best system, but we do use it for tracking purposes. And if you email me the service request numbers, I can help you follow through with it. And as you can see that uh, what CR29 does is that it uh, looks to find the vulnerable areas in, in the area and in the county. Um, and that's something that, as we've heard today, that the uh, Maryland Department of Environment is, is uh, something that they're urging all counties to do. And, that's, and so we were able to you know, have this passed uh, prior to, prior to uh, the June, July recess. Um, and so we're working closely with our Army Corps of Engineers and, and other agencies and, and finding these areas. Um, and that way we'll be able to present them to obviously Maryland Department of Environment and have, um, have uh, some conclusive solutions. So uh, we have presented these pieces of legislation. These are in committee. And what that means is, you know, all of the help that we can get in folks coming in and you know either presenting written testimony or speaking verbally on their support um, for the piece of legislation um, or disapproval piece of legislation if that's how you feel um, that this is something that we can we can do together um, and so cb10 is uh, council bill 10 and what this does is that expands a property tax credit for service connected veterans um, what we see is that Prince George's County has a tax credit for disabled veterans at 100%. Uh, we are attempting to lower that um, because of state enabling law. State, the state of Maryland is saying, you know, this is something that we think counties should do. We're not going to tell you to do it. Um, and so we need this piece of legislation to say, okay, we agree with what the state wants to do we want to implement it here. Um, and that, you know, it'll uh, bear lots of positives. It'll, it'll, bring, uh, it'll bring in residents into the county. We have the most amount of uh, veterans in this county um, compared to all the other uh, counties in the state. Uh, we have around 16,000 service connected veterans. Um, the next closest in is Anne Arundel County with I think around 13,000. 
and they have already passed this, this legislation. They have already done it. Um, and so moving to, uh, no questions, moving on to CB25, that's Council Bill 25. This is a bill that hopes to separate the connection between the engineers that do a study in a floodplain and the developers that choose to develop in a floodplain. And as we know that we, we see that the, the um, county has a lot of uh, floodplain areas and that we are seeing waivers being done and we are seeing uh, developments being put in place um, in vulnerable areas. And so the hope is that we can create a added barrier between the developers uh, and the engineers that are saying it's okay to build there. And that is that is the reason for this um, because, you know, and I will steal this from the assistant secretary, we have to be prepared uh, not only for the climate for, of today, but we have to be prepared for the climate of tomorrow. And I think that is, uh, that is how we can achieve that. And that is just one of the many tools that we're hoping to, uh, hoping to use. Universal design, uh, very much the council members uh, uh, baby. Um, you know, what we're hoping to do here is create housing for everyone. Um, and that's absolutely the key. We're looking for universal design uh, and universal living. Um, so you should be able to walk in and out of your home or uh, roll in and out of your home. Uh, you, if you're on crutches, you know, I broke my ankle in high school and going up to the second floor is very difficult. Um, and so we're talking, you know, in a county where we have uh, superstar professional athletes, we have young families moving in, um, we have uh, all different types of generation. And with the pandemic, we are seeing that all, we're seeing multi-generational living um, happening far more often, far more frequently and far longer. Um, student debt is, you know, adding in to uh, young, uh, young adults living at home longer. And so you, we have to be prepared and we have to design uh, for that. And what we're hoping to do is have 80% uh, of the projects uh, of any new development to include, you know, step-free entries, um, all of our key function areas. So your bathroom, uh, your kitchen, your bedroom, all on that first floor, whatever that floor would be. Um, so it's easily accessible and, uh, you know, on top of that public safety, so people can get in and out um, if need be. And there's some questions in the chat that I don't think I can answer, non-emergency police phone. Um, just wanted to point that out. And, and so, um, uh, one of the other pieces of legislation that we have uh, in committee also, and this is where obviously help from constituents is, is key, is that we want to have uh, increased tree canopies. We want to keep trees from being cut down. We want to focus on tree growing um, and keep, you know, you can't just cut down a tree um, and then plant a new one uh, nearby uh, or a baby tree nearby. It's not the same effect. And so we want to do is be on par with uh, neighboring jurisdictions and uh, keeping our trees uh, where we believe they should be in residential areas, um, which we know that will increase property values, that'll increase uh, the more green you see, the healthier you will be. Um, and what we want to do is in, 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 you know, legislate like that because that is how we should legislate. We should legislate for our county and this is one of the best ways that we can do that. Uh, we are very excited to be proposing a uh, resolution, uh, and th that's what this would be. That's called LDR, and LDR, for those that don't know, is a legislative draft request. So the way the process works of legislation is uh, it, to go from idea to something that we all talk about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, like a law, it has to go through this process, one of which is a basically requesting for it to be written by these by, by lawyers, and that's what the LDR is, it's, it's, we're requesting this to be done. And what it will turn into is a resolution. Um, and we are, we would like to have the county executive look back to twice a week trash collection. Uh, we also would like to see a report of what's been happening, what the complaints are, how much money 
uh, is coming in and how much money we're spending. If it was a if going from twice a week to once a week was what we hoped it would be, we were told we were going to save eight million dollars. We want to see if that was done, um, and that's and that's what we're that's what we're hoping to do. And uh, what we're hoping to do with a green bank um, is to you know double down on our green infrastructure investments. And what we want to do is bring residential resiliency. Uh, back to our residents, we want to focus on uh, bringing, you know, ways of combating climate change back to residents. Um, and what we are going to do is, is uh, look to do a study of, uh, you know, how feasible it is to, to have a green bank in Prince George's County. Montgomery County has a green bank. They've had a green bank since around 2016. Uh, Washington, D.C. has a green bank for, uh, for a similar amount of time. Um, New York has one, uh, and so we are seeing green banks all across the country um, filling these gaps in keeping, you know, combating climate change, putting money back into the pockets of, of, of residents, um, and just in the year 2020, uh, where everyone, uh, you know, economically was, was seeing, seeing a negative, um, uh, specifically economically, we know that there was 1.6, $1.7 billion uh, of investment uh, flying through green banks. And so this is the year to do it. We are seeing the infrastructure bill from the federal level. We are seeing American rescue plans coming through with historic investment in green energy. Um, and we don't wanna have Prince George's County left behind. And that's why we're legislating for that. So I will leave it there. I will answer any questions. Would a bulk pickup day be considered in lieu of a second trash pickup? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I don't know how to answer that just yet. Um, that is a, uh, yeah, I, th I, I think I don't know how to answer that, but I will find the answer to that. And I'll leave it to the council member. We had attempted just uh, piggyback. Great job, Hugo, um, with the explanation and great job team. Um, I want to piggyback on that last piece, though. We had attempted to um, institute a quarterly dumpster day where we would put 20 dumpsters out throughout communities for people to put whatever they need to put in there, uh, except for tires, um, so that we could have some control over uh, how people get rid of things. And, and the thought was, look, if we have a controlled dumpster day, people know to just hold on to their items until the day that big dumpster is coming. Um, unfortunately, we're still working through that process with, uh, with the county to see if, if we can actually institute it. Uh, the idea was to use Rosecroft funds, which is a fund for safety that um, District 8 has access to. Um, there are some other things that we're looking at as well, and I'll just mention them quickly. And that is um, community gardens, establishing community gardens with those funds and um, mortgage assistance in the form of no more than $500 a month uh, for people who have owned their homes for over 25 years that are 62 years of age um, that, have, um, uh, that have become challenged. What we're finding is that you know people hit a certain point in their life and health problems kick in. Um, they, they have money they have to spend on, on, on because of health issues. Uh, they're taking care of children or grandchildren they didn't anticipate taking care of. Um, maybe they had to refinance their house because of some catastrophic flood. Um, a whole lot of things happen. And we find our, our older population that is so invested in this community um, lose all their wealth because of big ticket items that they can't afford to pay out of pocket immediately. One of the reasons we're establishing or wanting to establish the Green Bank is so that people can get micro loans and grants uh, for those devastating types of, um, of issues that do happen because of no fault of their own. Uh, but, but we do wanna do it for people who are well established um, and have been here for a long time uh, because those seem to be the people who, who get the, the hurt the most. I don't want to belabor because I've taken so much of your time today. I hope this has been helpful to you. I do want to point out that uh, you do have your 
your state level uh, senator and delegates that are here to help you as well. Uh, senator Obi Patterson, uh, Delegate Veronica Turner, Delegate Chris Valderrama, and Delegate Jay Walker. He's my favorite. Um, he's also my husband. I got to mention that. Uh, and then, um, of course, uh, the last slide has uh, my information and my team's information. So feel free to follow up with any of us at any time. We're here for you. Uh, and we're, we're planning on having this recorded. I'm sorry, it is recorded. We will have this available to you, hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, and you should be able to find it. Gina, can you tell us how to find it? Yes, I put it in the chat, but it will be on the Councilwoman's YouTube page, Councilwoman Monique Anderson Walker, and will also be on her Facebook page, all of social media, and we'll also share it on, in an orange alert. And Talisha, we don't, we're not seeing the picture just yet. <laughs> Thank you. You've been doing a great job, everybody. This is Talisha's first time being the co-pilot, and she's been doing a fabulous job. <laughs> Great, great job team. And I can't thank you enough, Assistant um, Secretary Suzanne Dorsey. Um, you have been phenomenal sticking with this this whole time. And um, I see your passion because I could tell you're reading all of these comments. <laughs> and I'm glad because, um, you know, it feels good to see, um, to see that you're real and that, uh, that you'll do what you can. I think you know where we any are. Updates, any updates on the giant store? That's a question in oh, a... a great question. Uh, yes, uh, that is to be delivered um, fourth quarter. Yeah, fourth quarter uh, 2021. So in the next couple of months, November, December, that should be completed. Uh, it's looking better and better every day. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. I'll just leave you with this. Uh, I spoke with Maryland Department of Transportation. I'm sorry. Yeah, MDOT, Maryland Department of Transportation today, State Highway Administration, about um, getting a, a more frequent grass cutting schedule going. I'm sure you've all seen what I've seen and we want beautification here. And, and we want, um, we don't want that neglect. We don't, I shouldn't have to call, no one should have to call to have these things addressed. I want you to know, and I want you to um, keep in touch with us. Let us know what you need. We're here for you. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Uh, Councilwoman, can you just, we just talk about the uh, District 8 bike rodeo too that we're okay. having today? If you want to put that flyer up, you may. Uh, yeah. Okay. The bike rodeo is uh, this weekend, October 2nd, and it's from 12 to 2 at Bach Road, um, also known as South Tech. Um, we'll have food there. We will have excitement. Um, for those people who do not know how to ride a bike, or maybe they just forgot, although no one forgets how to ride a bike, you just have to get back on it. Um, you will, we will have opportunities to, uh, to get some, some coaching. And for those who want to go on a bike ride, we'll go on, on a ride, an extensive ride too. Um, we have beautiful trails here and we will be on the trails. So you'll be safe. Okay. And, and appreciate. We also have a sign up for DA seniors to come and, and sign up for cyclists, cycle club. And the councilwoman is going to take family on the bike trail. So it's going to be a fun day, live uh, dancing by our DA senior, seniors. Uh, they're going to do, do some line dancing, but uh, you can go on the trail with the councilwoman because we're starting to try to make sure everybody can get on a bike and ride and be healthy. And it's great weather for it. It's going to be a beautiful day on Saturday. Hope to see you all. <laughs> Carla, you want to talk about um, October 9th activity? Oh, yes. Um, Major Lay did talk about um, the Faith in Blue. Um, we will be at Eastover. We do, we're do. we doing a, um, a social justice walk, as well as that Sunday, we'll be at Fort Washington Baptist Church doing a walk in the community. Um, and also um, having like a little cookout. So we're gonna have at Fort Washington Baptist as well as District 4 Police Station in Eastover, a lot of vendors, um, food, um, hamburgers, hot dogs, fried fish. <laughs> what time? Um, District 4 Police Station at Eastover starts at 12 to four and on Sunday, District Seven in um, Fort Washington Baptist. The walk starts at ten to eleven thirty, and then we'll um, end up back down at Fort Washington Baptist Church 
from 12 to 1.30. Excellent. And, and we have Trunk or Treat at District 7 Police Station, um, October the 31st. Um, Force Heights have Trunk or Treat on October the 30th. And they're gonna have um, from five to about nine, they're gonna have a harvest festival from five to seven and then from seven to from seven to nine, they're gonna have um, trunk or treat and then they have a haunted house as well. Okay, and for those interested in um, a bike ride with our state's attorney and myself, we will be at Allen Pond on October 9th at 9 a.m. to, uh, it's called the Purple Bike Ride. And uh, this is to bring attention to domestic violence and, um, and to do our part to, uh, to fight against that. So hopefully oh. you will choose to join. Yes, is there and more? One more thing, one more thing. St. <laughs> Stephen's Baptist Church is having a um, domestic violence training coming up and I'll send out the information as well as they're having Purple Sunday, um, October the 17th. So I'll send out information to both of those events. So, um, you know, recognizing and helping make awareness to um, domestic violence. Wonderful, and thank you team. And thank you all for sticking with us. Um, have a wonderful remainder of the week and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. This is Secretary, she hang on the whole night. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have Thank a good you. Night, everyone. Thank you, team. Have a good night. Good night, everyone.